I will start as 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 other days. I just uh, want to do a, a quick presentation about the the Back to Fuel project because uh, every day we have done several webinars. Most of them are well. We have a start from 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 Monday explaining about the photocatalytic processes using atomic quantum clusters. Uh, then on Tuesday we have explained a little bit more in detail uh, about the um, the photocatalyst that we use and yesterday we saw we start the second the second part of, of back to fuel uh, when we talk about uh, acetogenes uh, genetic modification of acetogenes to produce biofuels and today uh, dr dipa pant he he will explain a little bit about uh, well some approaches uh, on bioelectrochemical systems using uh, co2 okay but uh, just just start by saying the, the back to full project is an acronym of bacterial conversion of CO2 and renewable hydrogen into biofuels. The, uh, the aim of this, this project is to, to demonstrate at TRL5 the possibility to produce biofuels, ethanol, butanol, and hexanol from CO2, water, and sunlight by using atomic quantum clusters and microbes. Okay. As I said, we couple uh, two methodologies that, uh, well, by themselves could work perfectly. The first one is a photocatalytic process. Just using the sunlight, the energy from sunlight, we are able to, to produce hydrogen, okay, by, by water splitting using, using a catalyst that has uh, been enhanced with atomic quantum clusters. This hydrogen will be fed, uh, will, will feed a bacteria in a second part where it is uh, transformed into added valid products like uh, ethanol and butanol. This bacteria is modified by uh, using different tools, as we saw yesterday, CRISPR-Cas and, and uh, other uh, pathways. And with the CO2, we are able to transform it in, in a bioelectrochemical system or a biochemical system uh, into, bio, into biofuel. This is the uh, the talk of today's talk. The consortium is based on four universities and two, uh, well, we'll say, uh, we'll say uh, companies like Vito and, and Nanogap, it's a research institute. Uh, the USC, Nanogap and Lancaster are most mm, focused on, on atomic quantum cluster characterization, synthesis, and so on. Uh, Berlin, the University of Berlin is the responsible for the photocatalytic part and also the, the responsible for, for, for coupling the, the both methodologies. Bachening is responsible of the genetic editing and Beto is, is the responsible for the bioelectrochemical systems and the, well, uh, and also the responsible for, for, uh, for uh, the, the demonstration of the project. Well, at the end, all the consortium is, is responsible for, for, for this part. So we couple nanotechnology, biotechnology, chemical engineering, an economy. That's the reason why we have uh, done uh, this, the, these six webinars during, during this week before Christmas in order to present well the work we do and um, our, 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 our purpose to, to, to continue working through, through, uh, through implementation of this technology into the industry by, by increasing the TRL up to TRL 9. So that's the reason why we have added also economy. Tomorrow we will see this part, the, the last part of, of the project that is, is more related to economy. And well, uh, that's, that's more or less the main idea of, of Back to Full project. And now I, I will give the floor to, uh, to Dr. Deepak in order to you to, to present your, your, your work. Thank you. Go ahead, the floor is yours, uh, Deepak. Thank you. Thank you, Ignacio. Thanks a lot. And uh, welcome, everyone. It's time to uh, join this session, uh, one of the webinars in the project. You have to excuse me for my voice. I have a little bit of you, so not the bad one. I told some participants earlier. <clears throat> now you have seen me. I will turn off my video just to save the bandwidth. Then, and, uh, because working from home, the signal strength is not that strong as it is at the office. And then I will share my presentation immediately. <clears throat> So now, and I will change now the display settings so that you see the full screen. And you have to tell me, Ignacio, if you see it right on. Not yet. Yeah. 
Not Perfect. Yet. So I will start. Uh, so in back to fuel. No, we, we don't. We don't see it. Uh, I don't see it. Uh, you don't see it yet. Wait. Then I will let me try once more. Uh, go back here. Share screen. Screen. Share. Now maybe. Now. Now. Now we can see, see perfectly. Ah, now we can see that's perfect. Now it should be correct. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. So, uh, like uh, Inasio said, my name is Deepak Bhatt. I'm working at uh, VITO, which is the Flemish Institute for Technological Research. And in Back to Food project, we are responsible for Work Package 6, which deals with the developing uh, an electro bioreactor. That's how it is first proposed in the, in the project. And to show that the, the, the technology coupling of the photoelectrochemical system as well as the bio system works perfectly to produce some fuel molecules uh, starting from CO2 and hydrogen as a, as a feedstock. And I specifically mention hydrogen because it has an important role to play, as you will see now. But uh, before going into the technical details, a very uh, uh, one quick words about the institute that I work. So we is the RTU, so not a university, which means it's a, a technological uh, research institute involved in mainly R and D and consultancy. And here are some numbers uh, that you see. So it's still uh, older from 2019. I think now we are more than 950 people, including PhDs and postdocs. A lot of uh, nationalities work here, more than 35. And uh, main work is on, on technology and, and uh, R&D. So a lot of patents are filed and scientific publications are also made. But a lot of work that we do is also in combination with companies or for companies. So that, that is under contract research and, and we never kind of publish it because it's uh, protected uh, by the bilateral agreement with the companies. In terms of research areas, uh, the institute is divided into five main uh, Themes. One is on sustainable energy, sustainable chemistry, sustainable materials, sustainable health, and sustainable land use. And the topic of CCU, which is carbon dioxide capture and its utilization, is spread over actually three different units. And as you will see why it is the case, <coughs> I belong to the unit of sustainable chemistry here. Now, uh, we actually earlier, my research unit was known as uh, environmental and process technology, and a lot of work was done on bioremediation I mean, of topics. But in 2009, we changed the direction and, and named it as sustainable chemistry. Also, all the research topics were about change. And the logic at that time was because uh, Flanders is a hub of chemical industry, the harbor of Antwerp has a, has a, has a large amount of, of chemical companies, together with Port of Rotterdam and I do Westphalia region. This is kind of a, a central hub of chemical industry. But the issue is most of them use uh, fossil as their feedstock as well as fossil energy to drive those uh, their reactions. As output, they give us chemicals and some side streams or waste products are, are uh, released. Now, the idea was if we can intensify this conversion and separation processes, so either they use less feedstock or an alternative feedstock to shift from fossil energy to more sustainable energy and instead of waste uh, produce resource or their waste is, is converted into a resource and used to make something else. So this was the core idea. So the idea was to move from fossil feedstock to the circular carbon <clears throat> and the side streams then go towards uh, creating more chemicals. So, so the idea was to reuse the waste and, and it should be an end of life given to these kind of streams. And of course, as I said, the fossil should be replaced by renewable feedstock and fossil energy should be replaced by renewable energy. And the idea was if we can help them in doing all this by process intensification, also suggesting so better solvents, uh, uh, alternative uh, catalysts and all those things. So that was the background, uh, how the, the research area started in 11 years ago. And one of the themes among all the others that I explained just now uh, for our uh, own uh, team, which is a team of around 15, 16 researchers, including technicians and, and, and PhD students and postdocs, we defined electrochemistry as a, as a defining overarching theme. The reason is because it's an, a very nice alternative for uh, reactions which are highly exothermal, which means cogeneration. So even now, this is very much in fashion, these terms, power to X, power to molecules, power to chemicals, power to fuel. We actually started a long time ago, 2011, we did a project on cogeneration where the idea was to, to produce hydroxylamine from NO gas and uh, use the, the, the resulting uh, uh, the, the thermochemical energy into, into current as well. 
So the second point is it also can replace highly endothermal reactions. So starting from CO2 as a feedstock and energy from electrons to go for e-fuels. So this can be done in fuel cells, flow cells, uh, as you all know. Then it's an alternative also for temperature sensitive reactions because uh, you can have higher uh, reaction speeds and also you can make them very selective just by changing the catalyst or biocatalyst uh, in this case, like in, in the case of this project. Then second point is it also allows the opportunity to combine all these convergent reactions, whether uh, CO2 as a feedstock or bio-based chemicals as a feedstock to couple it with the renewable electricity. Now you all know the share of renewables is increasing each year in, in Europe, but also the rest of the world. And, and the cheapest uh, solar is actually available in India as, as we speak. And the idea is to, to, to electrify these uh, traditional chemical processes so as to have, uh, uh, have, a, have a local uh, resources on the feedstock, have a lower volatility in the production cost, because then uh, now if you, if you know the, the European policy, it is assumed that by 2050, we will have uh, all the uh, electricity, uh, non fossil based, completely renewable. And it's a, it's a very ambitious target, but which can be met uh, with the current right policies, uh, which, are, which is the case right now. Eh? And also the idea is to create truly renewable chemicals with a net consumption of CO2. So instead of these processes releasing any CO2 as a greenhouse gas, they are actually consuming it as a feedstock. So this is the whole, whole background of uh, us in being involved in in, in the research that we are doing. <clears throat> now, in terms of carbon cycle, this is a very nice uh, figure from BTT, which is again a research institute in Finland. Uh, they published a, a, a white paper called the Carbon Reuse Economy in 2019. And it uh, very nicely show how the future of a society based on uh, CCU might look like. Yeah? So what you see inside here is, uh, okay, let's see if you can, my mouse, yeah, you can see my mouse. This is, here is the direct air capture, which is capturing all the CO2, which is coming out from industrial processes, households, all the energy consumption. And then you have uh, the, the, the products from this carbon uh, coming into food material. So if you know, your people are now making uh, uh, CCU. So uh, sorry, I might have some uh, messages coming up, but I guess not. So uh, to make single cell proteins, uh, so food, materials, as well as fuels, these are then consumed, then again released CO2. Part of it is taken up by the biomass, which is actually stable for a long time if these trees are not cut. But of course, uh, this biomass is a source of feedstock as well. And this is again really the CO2. And that's a nice uh, circular example of a CCU based economy for the future. We are not there yet, but efforts are going on in this direction. Now, in terms of uh, capturing and converting this CO2, there are actually different ways you can do it. Traditionally, plants have been doing it for a very long time. Then this kind of organic biomass, uh, which comes out from your kitchens, or for any organic stream undergoes anaerobic digestion. Uh, this is a traditional age-old process. You produce methane, and this can be used as a power source. Then you can also have a gasification. So you make the CO, and in presence of hydrogen, this is syngas, and syngas fermentation is, is, is quite advanced process and with which you can make uh, even more chemicals. Uh, then you have the water electrolysis. So it's producing hydrogen, and hydrogen is in itself an energy carrier, but it can be also used to drive the CCU reactions, as you will see in the, in the coming slides. And of course, uh, the last opportunity is the direct conversion of CO2. We can do it either via electrochemical, so starting with a, with a C1 uh, formate or formic acid, or even higher uh, molecules um, that are possible. So a range of products are possible to make uh, from CO2, starting from chemicals, fuel, plastic, protein, and nanomaterials. Now, just slide, I just give an overview of all the kind of activities uh, that are ongoing in our team. Um, so as I said, Starting from 2016 onwards, we started using uh, CO2-based projects. And the idea is that these, these projects are split over four main themes. One is hydrogen and energy storage. Second one is new synthesis, where we are making materials, electrodes, and uh, nanoparticles. But again, using them back in the process of uh, conversion. Then you have CO2 electro reduction. And finally, uh, fuel cells. This is a new line we are going to start. And some new projects have just been granted. So just to give an example, we are involved in a, in a European uh, SPIRE project called PERFORM, where we, the starting material is sugars, and the idea is to electrochemically convert this into first gluconic acid and glutaric acid by oxidation, and then in the next step, reduce that to adipic acid. 
So we and, and then uh, as you see over the year coming years, the idea is to move this up to PRL five in some projects and going up to even PRL seven, which means a real demonstrator at an industrial location using a real industrial field stock. And that is also actually the ambition for active fuel, not in the project itself, but in a subsequent extension of it. And then, like Ignacio mentioned, we want to we want to continue with this research direction in the coming years. Now, hydrogen has a very important role to play in, in, in this whole scenario. So we now we have now embarked on, on a couple of uh, three or four projects that have just been granted, where uh, we are looking to uh, to develop new membranes and electrolyzers uh, for uh, advanced hydrogen production not as an energy carrier itself, but to use it into uh, the CCU uh, projects, right? Then in terms of uh, CCU in our team and, and, and rest of the video, so in the first, the main approach is electrochemical CO2 conversion, like I mentioned, and their main focus has been development of gas fusion electrodes, as well as electrocatalyst development, and we also do the process engineering. And in terms of uh, gas diffusion electrodes, actually we are at a quite high level. We are already at TRL7, where we can make the electrodes in certain size, going up to meter square at, um, at a pre-industrial facility. We have a pilot production facility, as you can see here. It's not a, a large picture, but just to give you an idea. And then using these electrodes in such uh, reactors, so we start small, like 10 centimeters square, when we are doing the catalyst screening, and going up to uh, stacks. But then there we can use several of uh, <coughs> single cell uh, uh, cells to combine them into a stack going from 100 to 400 centimeters square. So this is actually a, 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 a pilot reactor that is being currently under uh, production for methanol production from CO2 and purely electrochemical. But we also have a team on biotechnology who have already worked for uh, almost uh, 10 years now on, on production of polyhydroxy alkanoid and polyhydroxy butyrate, which are traditionally the bioplastics uh, or biopolymers as we call them. And it's completely uh, a microbial process where the, uh, the biomass in the first step, we grow the biomass on organic carbon source, and then we deprive it. Uh, and then the organic, uh, in, a, in a nutrient limiting condition, it starts converting the CO2, which is the only uh, bio uh, carbon source uh, into these uh, molecules, DHA and THP. So this has been already demonstrated at a quite a high TRL, and now they are in talk with companies to uh, you know, take this up further. Another team is working on algae harvesting in biorefinery. So they work on downstream processing, not growing the algae themselves, but uh, rather uh, taking out the chemicals and how to, uh, how to process after somebody has grown the algae on a large scale. Then I also told about materials. So another colleague, your team on materials have developed a process on carbonation where they fix the CO2 into steel slags and a product called carbstone is already now uh, commercially being sold by a company called Orbix, and they are now uh, trying to, uh, to make a, a better market for it. And most of the time, these are currently not used um, in the construction of houses, but you know, like making pavements or dikes uh, around, the, around the sea. Finally, in all the projects that we do, we always include it in the techno-economic analysis, and that's also uh, uh, our colleagues from TU Berlin are doing now for back to fuel, as well as a life cycle assessment. Now, in terms of ambition, the idea is to have a 20 ton of pilot in the next coming three to four years uh, to show that these technologies work and they are also economically feasible and, and make a nice technology value chain. That's our ambition and, and all of these projects are actually feeding in the, that, that direction. Vito is also a founding member of CO2 Value Europe. It's a policy organization based in Brussels, which is actually advancing the, uh, the, the policy for CCU with the European Commission, but with a lot of other uh, funding agencies. And it pushes the case for why CCU is so important and why it should be supported, uh, not only financially, but also politically. And, uh, and we are a member of that, and we try to do that kind of uh, activities as well uh, via this organization. And uh, since a few years, we are also part of Capture, which is a kind of a center of excellence uh, based in Ghent, and uh, where four Flemish partners are uh, joined hands, uh, including University of Antwerp, Ghent University, and uh, VUB in Brussels. And one of the main themes there is also on, on CCU or CO2 conversion. So with this background, I come to the, to the technical part. And the first part is about direct air capture, but this is only in one slide because this is something we have been doing. And if you saw my uh, picture earlier uh, the, at my background when I was uh, turning on the video, so you see a pilot there. So that pilot is actually um, kind of a direct air capture unit, uh, which is linked 
USEO kernel. So Vito has been working for last 15 years or so on developing uh, the whole concept of, uh, of, of uh, geothermal in, in, in Tampin region. So we have several of these wells from which the hot water comes out, which is used for cooling the, cooling the offices in nearby buildings. And when the water goes back uh, with the second well to the underground, the residual heat is extracted by organic ventilation cycle, as it's called, and it's converted into electricity. And that electricity can then be used to drive these ventilators uh, on top. As you can see, there are 32 of them, if I remember correctly. They suck the air, and in the air, you have CO2 at the very low concentration, 400 ppm, but that's enough. And then inside, we have some, some capturing agents which capture the CO2, and then by a, another process, it's released, and pure CO2 is generated. And that pure CO2 can then be actually used uh, for further conversion processes by any of the technologies that I showed you just now. Now, in terms of global overview of the CCU, there are several approaches which are already quite well developed and being used commercially uh, at a very high TRL. So one of them is, so you can basically classify them into two types and in each slide I have given the reference. So this is a very nice paper from Graham et al. I think it's from NREL, uh, who compared almost all CCU technologies um, and, uh, and made a very nice overview there. So you have either the direct pathway and you have the direct pathway. Indirect is on top where you can use the CO2 for enhanced oil recovery, improve in beverages and like uh, carbon, carbonated things like Coca-Cola. Uh, to produce uh, fertilizers, uh, again, I, like I mentioned, to make uh, these uh, carbonates and to blocking them in the, in the, in the bricks uh, kind of structure and all of these polyols, poly THAs, and also via LB. These are all uh, indirect, uh, uh, non-reductive pathway. And then you have the direct pathway, which includes the conversion via electrochemical, bioelectrochemical, plasma, or thermochemical. The advantage of this bottom part is this is the one which allows us to link it to the electricity consumption. So you can hold easily, all of these processes need electricity. And then if you have excess of electricity, so this is the part which can be linked to renewable uh, energy storage, uh, so to speak. So that's the advantage of it. And as a, as a function of uh, TRL development, this is also at a lower TRL um, right now. Of course, all of them are not at the same TRL also. Some are lower developed, some are higher developed, but I think that's indicated by this plus symbol here. So if you read this paper, you will get a lot of uh, nice information about it. Now coming back to microbial electrochemical conversion. So this is a slide uh, I use very often because it's in one picture I can show you everything that's happening uh, in a bioelectrochemical system. So initially when, when the field started, it started um, at a, as a bio anode in which you have a specific bacteria uh, which attach and, and grow on, as a biofilm on the electrode surface, which is the anode. And as a function of their metabolism, they can release electrons out of their body. So it's a federal electron transfer and deposit it on the solid electrode. So like you must have heard of, uh, of bacteria like Geobacter and Schwannella. These are the most famous ones that are used here. And this was mainly used for wastewater treatment and energy recovery. At the same time, you have protons generated, which goes through this proton exchange membrane to the cathode. And the electrons are passed through an external circuit. And if you can measure how much electrons are passing, you can measure how much current your system is producing. So this was the basic idea of a microbial fuel cell. At the cathode, the, the oxygen most of the time acts as an electron acceptor, and then your circuit is complete. So by combining a bio anode, where you oxidize organic material present in the wastewater, and by reducing oxygen at the cathode, you get microbial electrochemical uh, fuel cell system. Now, you, what you can also do is make the system anaerobic. And by application of uh, external uh, electricity input, so that's why I, I have indicated both here, power generation as well as power input, you can combine these protons and make hydrogen. So bio anode combined with a, uh, with, a, with a cathode producing hydrogen, what you get is a microbial electrolysis system. So microbial electrolysis, electrolysis to hydrogen. <clears throat> and then in 2010 onwards, uh, uh, Professor Lovely, uh, from the University of uh, Massachusetts, uh, he came up with the concept of microbial electrosynthesis. He said not only hydrogen, you can also actually using another set of bacteria, which has a different property than, than these ones, the green ones, that they can accept electrons from the solid electrodes, so electrotrophs. You can convert CO2 into products. And the first ones they showed uh, uh, was uh, acetic acid. And uh, since then, this field has really boomed. And now, I think so more each year, more than 2,000 publications are coming out. Now, when you use a bio cathode, most of the time it's coupled to a, a abiotic anode in which uh, you just uh, produce uh, oxygen at the anode. So that, but that's also an energy uh, intensive step uh, 
so to speak. So that's also must be taken care of uh, when you want to advance this system. So this is in a nutshell is the background of a microbial electrochemical system, both from the anode side and the cathode side. Applications are are the time I will show you now. Now this is a a slide uh, also coming from a recent paper from Chu et al, which uh, very nicely show all the application areas of microbial electrochemistry. So the first one they show is the, the carboxylate platform. So where you, you combine <coughs> the volatile fatty acids, uh, are oxidized, and at the same time, you have a, a CO2 reduction at the, at the cathode side, producing methane. You have a syngas platform. So like I said, when you have CO plus H2, you can, it's, it's a very well-developed uh, platform. And the, the, the company Lanzatech is using this to produce acetate but on a large scale. They have a, a quite big pilot um, at this moment running in India, and they feed this to algae uh, ponds afterwards. The third one is the sugar platform, and this is the one I showed you earlier. So these are the main three uh, bio platforms that can be made by combining microbiology and electrochemical convergence. Now in the same paper, they also showed the role of electrochemistry to play in each step of the value chain. So they say in the first step, like I mentioned, power production, this is the microbial fuel cell concept where you combine uh, the organics in the wastewater uh, to produce electricity. You can also have a role of electrochemistry in, in the pre-treatment of it, which goes into the bioconvergence, which is the steering. Now the concept of electrofermentation is also coming up in a big way where people are trying to steer the fermentation process towards a particular product by applying certain potential and a combination of specific bacteria. Once you have made the product, you can still use electrochemistry by, by way of electro separation, by charge separation to, to remove the desired product. And you can even go for electrochemical upgrading. So you can even upgrade it to a higher value uh, commodity chemical or fuel in the last step. So as you can see, so you can actually have a, a very nice uh, electrochemical or bioelectrochemical refinery. This is a conceptual stage, but it's not so far from the practice if you, if you think of it, because all of these techniques have been or are being investigated at different levels uh, at, at quite some nice TRL at the moment. Now, in the next step is, uh, and this I, I inserted at the last minute, this is a paper from Phil de Luna uh, from uh, University of Toronto in Canada, where uh, this, uh, in the, this was a conceptual scheme they presented in, in science last year. The idea is to combine the two, but not in one part, uh, in, in two steps. So in the first step, what you can do is to use the renewable electricity, as you see here, coming from either hydro, wind, solar, and uh, make syngas. Again, like I said, syngas is a platform molecule. And then it can be used uh, by either the lines or bacteria directly to make long chain commodity chemicals. On the other hand, you can also have a CO2 electrolyzer making hydrocarbons, formic acid, methanol as the base molecule. And then in the second reactor, bioreactor, this uh, uh, bacteria can use it or, or other microorganisms can use it as a feedstock to make, uh, make further chemicals. So actually this week uh, was very nice because we just won a European project together with uh, a lot of colleagues who were working in this field, including uh, from University of Autonoma Barcelona, who actually coordinated the project where we are going to do exactly this scheme, which is shown here. So we will convert CO2 and, and water into formic acid and methanol. In the second step, uh, they have a yeast-based uh, platform. Then we will make lactic acid and succinic acid as our final products. And, and we also have some industrial partners who are uh, involved in that. So the project is called Vivaldi, and you will hear, I think, in, in summer about it and the work we do uh, in that project. So our role for Vito, we are only restricted to this part, and, and the bio part will be taken up by the other partners, including Goku in, in, in Austria. Now, yesterday, uh, if uh, for those of you who attended uh, the presentation of our colleague from uh, Wageningen, he showed several pathways uh, in which these convergence can happen. And depending on the on the bacteria and the pathway which is present, you can either go via formate as the first compound uh, that is used, and then formate can be upgraded to all these isobutene, also the salbutene, PAB. You can have CO, like I mentioned, and then this can go further after. Uh, either fermentation or fissure trough into ethanol or diesel. Then you can have a uh, biogas upgrading as they call it. So the biogas which consists of mainly uh, methane but also a significant amount of CO2 can be further converted into methane by different pathways and then this methane base can go to uh, these higher compounds or molecules, right? 
Then acetate is one of the favorite uh, compounds of microbial electrosynthesis and a lot of uh, research has uh, been devoted on it, but this is just uh, a bulk molecule, uh, not so high market value. So you can up further take it and by other uh, steps to, to higher. So a lot of possibilities are there and uh, a, lot, a lot of them are at different uh, levels of uh, advancement at this moment. Just show an example of how it works in, in real time. This is coming from Lanzatec, which is uh, the famous company originated in New Zealand, but now based in USA. And this, they published this paper uh, this year in Current Opinion Biotechnology, and they show an example of a, of a real municipal gas they feed in. This is a plant in China they mentioned, and uh, so they have three types of uh, gases they feed: CO2, syn gas, or industrial waste gas, which go either to electrolysis, gasification. Then it goes under their uh, fermentation. Fermentation. They have a stream of uh, genetically modified bacteria, uh, several of them based on Clostridium, and then this goes into uh, into the final products. In terms of uh, gas composition, this is what uh, they showed the ratio they maintain. And in terms of selectivity, you see their production system is quite selective, and uh, close to 95, 98 percent is uh, going towards ethanol, whereas only a very small amount of other uh, products are made in this, uh, in this uh, conversion system. So that's that's already uh, quite uh, quite nice. They are now building a very large uh, uh, near commercial plant in Ghent uh, uh, at the location of ArcelorMittal to convert the off gases from steel industry uh, to make ethanol. They call it steel, steel anol is the, is the name they have given to it. Now I mentioned to you our own um, activities uh, earlier is, is uh, mainly on, on gas diffusion electrode development. And we did this initially for uh, oxygen production in microbial fuel cells because uh, most of the researchers when we started were using platinum, palladium or other platinum group metals, which was actually not required because we work at very low current densities. So how the, so we uh, came up with the idea of using just activated carbon or graphite or carbon black uh, based electrodes, which were good enough, long lasting and uh, quite economical uh, to use in MFCs. So the basic concept is, is quite simple that you have three layers, a gas diffusion layer, a catalyst layer, and, uh, and the current collector. And inside uh, the gas diffusion layer is completely hydrophobic. So it allows the gas to go only in one direction, but do not allow electrolyte to, to be leaked, uh, so to speak. And the activated, uh, the catalyst layer has both hydrophilicity and hydrophobicity. So it allows the, the conduction of protons as well as electrons coming from externally. So um, this was uh, this is how it looks like. I don't know if you can see it very good. So this is a, 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 the real, uh, and we sell now actually make them near commercial uh, under the trade name of Vito Core and Vito Case. And uh, since we started on CO2 conversion electrochemical, we have also been working on metal based GDEs. We have filed a couple of patents uh, in the last two three years. Uh, this is a copper based gas diffusion electrode. This is a tin based, and in this case, we actually don't even need a separate uh, gas diffusion layer. This metal-based uh, layer itself is enough to keep the electrolyte and allow the, the, the gas uh, to, to reach the, the catalyst layer. This is just some results uh, from when we uh, when we started. This was uh, done with uh, Professor Bruce Logan uh, from Penn State University, and we did these uh, tests for oxygen reduction still uh, for quite some time, starting from three months and eventually uh, running a system more than 18 months uh, in operation. Last uh, two years ago, we developed uh, upscale these electrodes going up to meter square, and it worked uh, quite nicely in the sense that even when going from this 10 centimeter square to one meter square, there was no leakage, and uh, we did not lose a lot of current. So the, home, the current distribution was quite homogeneous. So we have a patent on it, and then afterwards, the same set of electrodes were used by the University of Bochum. Uh, to test um, real municipal waste water in 255 liter microbial fuel Now, when we started working on CO2, we also used the same electrodes of, uh, with, a, with a changed composition uh, for efficient uh, CO2 supply to the biocatalyst, which in our case was either enzyme or a real bacteria, uh, a whole cell, uh, as they say. And when we did the, uh, when we compared it to a system where we were just sparking CO2 via a needle. Uh, we saw that the KLA for CO2 dilution was, was almost double when using the GDE. So this was uh, a work done in the PhD of Suman Dakitaria, my student, who is now a postdoc at uh, Lunia University in Sweden. Then also here what you see is 
uh, initially we had very low production rates when we were just uh, using this arch system but when we should switch to, to the DDE uh, we could get uh, a quite decent amount of uh, acetic acid as well as ethanol and butyric acid now we have a project on, on co2 conversion with uh, one of the industries in india called indian oil r d center and they have been using our our electrode initially for uh, ethanol production because they are being an oil company they are only interested in ethanol so they can easily blend it with their existing product uh, uh, gasoline um so they, this was published in, in biosystem technology two years ago and what you see here is the changing profile of uh, products over time so initially it was only formic acid c1 but as the time progressed uh, the amount of ethanol uh, kept on going after this uh, patent, we made a new design of a, of, a, of a electrode for them, and now it's under uh, operation in a 500 liter uh, microbial electrosynthesis pilot. These results, I hope, uh, will come next year. Now, coming back to the MES biorefinery, I have uh, talked about uh, how the bacteria does the, the reaction. But if you look here, there are different ways in which the, the electron transfer takes place from the cathode to the bacteria. It can be either direct electron transfer, but there are very few reports in, in literature of that happening. And most of the time, actually, it happens via hydrogen. So most of the MES studies uh, report that MES is, is hydrogen mediated. And that's why I said in the previous slides that hydrogen play a, a very important role uh, in this whole process. <clears throat> now, there was a paper in uh, by Erica Bl uh, Elise Blanchett in 2015 in the environmental science. Uh, from uh, Indra Toulouse, a uh, group from the group of Alain Belgian, and they very nicely showed this. And so this is how this happens. This is the, the direct electron transfer where the bacteria has on the surface of the uh, electrode. This is when you still have some mediators, and this is via hydrogen. And at that time, they it made some economic calculations as well. And actually, we, what we find very nice at that time was that the electrochemical reactor was actually just a hydrogen supplier for the bacteria. So it, most of the time you don't need a biofilm it can be also planktonic it can be free floating in, in the cell and as long as there is you can assure the supply of hydrogen enough in, in the reactor you will have an efficient production system we also observed it in several of our uh, projects and, and, and experiments that uh, most of the time hydrogen was one of the limiting elements and that's also linked to that so hopefully in the next webinar uh, you will have more results about it we also did i think it's taking a longer time let me check uh, the time okay i'm close uh, so i will just say we have also done a lot of experiments on uh, integration of uh, renewable electricity and how it impact uh, the, uh, the microbial electrosynthesis and we run these systems at a gap uh, of starting from four hours six hours eight up to 64 hours and we saw how does the system how fast the system recovers not only in terms of current density but also the acetate production and we saw the bigger the gap was uh, the more time it takes the system to recover. So it's kind of the, the system is more or less tolerant to fluctuations in, in electricity supply, but um, uh, uh, you cannot uh, say that I can keep it uh, for a very long time like that. And we did it with both uh, uh, bicarbonate as a feedstock, but also with the real CO2. And, in the, and, and we also analyzed the, the microbial community. And we saw that uh, the microbial community interestingly was uh, both acetogenic and hydro, hydrogen producing bacteria were there, but in the supernatant, a lot of uh, fermentative bacteria were there. So, we, if there is a gap, if there, suppose there is no electricity supply, so the products like acetic acid, which are made, are consumed by this uh, fermenting bacteria. We also did a long term interruption in uh, uh, like three, four weeks. We, uh, we, we left the uh, well running uh, MES. And we saw after that when the system recovered, uh, it, it did recover in terms of microbial electrosynthesis, but it never went back to uh, making volatile fatty acids like acetic acid, but it always produced uh, methane. So the idea was that uh, the, the acetogenic bacteria were taken over by the methanogenic uh, RPA in this case. So that was also finished beginning of this year. In terms of uh, comparison of uh, so classical fermentation versus bioelectrochemical, this is uh, the again that's coming from Grim. And you can see this is still at TRL3, 1, 2, 3, this is TRL4, 7. And, and there are several research needs uh, which are raised here, and some of which we are trying to also address in, in back to the and There is a very nice paper if you want to see the cost economics uh, of the whole system by Ludovic uh, from TU Delft uh, together with David Slip. 
So you can see which are the major uh, factors which are impacting your ME microbial electrosynthesis. And as you can see, electricity has a price has a very major impact on this uh, because of, you know, it, 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 it contributes a lot to the to the overall efficiency process efficiency. Cell voltage, paradigm efficiency, current density, all of them are important in terms of premium reactor performance. And in terms of uh, capex, which means the capital expenditure, if you want to set it up at commercial level, then these are the, the main anode has a, has a big cost. As you can see, membrane is, is quite important. Cathode cost is also significant, but not as much as anode. And in terms of uh, uh, reactor performance, you have current density, paradigm efficiency, as well as how much electrons can you actually put into the final product as well. So it's a very nice paper, you should read it, coming uh, just a few months ago. And this is almost the last slide I would say. So this is the uh, time period of different technologies for CCU as you can see. So the near feed term, it will be five to 10 years electrocatalysis, photocatalysis. They say 10 to 50 years biohybrid, nanoporous confinement, and 70 years, I mean, you will uh, see that gene insertion in molecular machines. Um, yeah, you can have a look at it afterwards. So to conclude, what I would say is it's a, it's a very interesting technology for fuel and chemical production because it allows for renewable electricity storage, CO2 utilization, as well as by if you couple the bio and uh, organic waste management. Uh, in terms of uh, cathodic microbial attachment is expected to increase the efficiency of electron transfer, but it was quite low current density. And if the process is driven by hydrogen, it does not matter that much, I would say. Anode material cost in electricity convention are the main capital and operating costs that will influence the upscaling of the system. And currently, even if you look, it's not uh, viable in current state of the art. We hope with the project like Back to Cube, we can improve uh, these systems to have a positive net present value and make them profitable in coming years. Right? So, yeah, I just always promote this book because it came earlier this year, and a lot of uh, uh, researchers from, uh, from this field have uh, chapters there. Have a look, it's also a lot of chapters are freely available on Google Books. And if this presentation interested you, maybe you can also think of joining Eastwood Society, which is the society of all the researchers uh, working in this area. There are several advantages, including reduced registration fee at conferences, access to online lectures, and, and regular updates about jobs and everything in this field. So, think about it. Thank you very much for your attention, and I look forward to hear some questions from you now. Ignacio, over to you. Okay, well, thank you so much, Deepak. It was well, a extraordinary presentation. I really enjoyed it. You, you saw us, uh, well, too many publications, uh, the state, the real state of the art of, of micro electro uh, synthesis. And well, I have questions. Well, for every slide, I have a question mm -hmm. uh, because it's, it's, it's really interesting. But let's see what the people think and what the, the questions from, from the audience. There is a question on the chat. I don't know, Deepak, if you can read it or... Yeah, I can read it. Okay. I can read it. Yes, I can read it. It's from mm -hmm. Alessandro. Is there currently solid experimental proof that transfer of electrons? Mm, yeah, no, no, not solid, I would say. Uh, there, first of all, there are very few papers, Alessandro. I think I can count them on, on fingertips, five or six, uh, so to speak. Uh, and they two go towards polyhydroxy alkanoid butyrate production. Uh, Rhodos to the Munas Paulestris. There was a paper from Alfred Foreman last year, I think, and also Frau Kataki. No, but that's also uh, about uh, hydrogen. So, no, the, I, uh, solid evidence, as you say, no, I don't think there is. It's also still a lot of assumptions and hypotheses. Secondly, you say independently of the current or voltage applied to the system, the main electron transfer that takes this via that, that's that's more solid. I would say yes, that that is uh, that I'm quite sure of. In, in in a lot of these systems, I would say most of these systems, the hydrogen evolution happens at the cathode. But like I showed in one of the slides, uh, even when we were not uh, supplying uh, any in, uh, current or potential to the electrode. There were, when we analyzed the bacteria, there was uh, a community of hydrogenotrophic uh, bugs. And, and this is especially of uh, when you are using a big sculpture. You can never be sure because a portion of the hydrogen is probably coming from electrochemistry and applied potential, whereas a portion of hydrogen might be coming from the, this set of bacteria. So you can never say for very sure that where it is coming from, but it's coming uh, that the process is mediated by hydrogen. That I can be sure of. Yes. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. 
Well, let's see if there are other questions. Oh, you can directly unmute yourself and ask. Yes. You don't need yeah, to type. Yeah, yeah. It's okay. It's yeah, a small group. <laughs> yeah, you can. Ah, I see Carlos is also here. Hello, Carlos. <laughs> Hello, how are you? I'm fine. Well, Carlos, it's nice to hear you and then to, to follow up a little bit on your updates. Do you and have any question, you. Carlos? So I think this gives a better idea of what, what is possible. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. No, no, no. It's just, it's just you were saying something. If, if you if you have any question, please uh, go ahead. Uh, well, <laughs> and, and have the, 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 the chance we have here, Deepak, and you can ask him. <laughs> yeah, sure. But uh, well, one thing could be that we we are working on on seeing gas fermentation and putting some electrons on it. You are aware about that. Mm -hmm. And then in one of your slides, you discuss a little bit about the in a way, turn around process. I mean, mm -hmm. producing seeing gas through electrochemistry. Right. Uh, how do you see about that? Because you, by having hydrogen, uh, why don't my use use directly for some reason? But um, we, we are thinking about if you have any experience about the, um, yeah, uh, have you hear or know about somebody else working? Because we, the thing we want is we want to increase the rate of hydrogen uh, mm -hmm. And especially CO going through the I mean, seeing gas fermentation, but we need to increase the rate by just adding a very, very little voltage. Yes. Uh, somebody oh. else doing that or some, some experience on that? Yes. So if I understand correctly, your question is that to produce syn gas or to use syn gas? To use syn gas. Use syn gas. Yes. Yeah. So, so then, no, no, there are several groups, uh, on, not only at research level. Uh, the first example I gave you is Lambda Tech, but of course it's a company, so you you might not have all the information that you want from them. But in, in Netherlands, I know in, in, in Delft University, and we are also part of that project, not me personally, but my colleague, it's called ProSyn, and we have a joint PhD with them. That's completely on, on syn gas fermentation. But what I think is uh, they are also trying to use, I'm not... Uh, 100% sure uh, to use genetically modified bacteria by, by adapting okay. the bacteria by CRISPR-Cas and make them very specific. Uh, that's that's one thing. And the second question you ask is about hydrogen production. I know personally, yes, um, we have been approached by some companies. Of course, I cannot name them uh, here, uh, who who have this issue of uh, hydrogen limitation. Eh? So the, the process is only limited by the hydrogen that they can supply. Yeah. So they are came to us with the question that if we can help them uh, improve the, the uh, hydrogen availability to the biocatalyst by producing it in situ. So we made some suggestions. We start still uh, talking with them. And I think the electrodes designs that I showed just now are quite suitable uh, to be inserted into such bioreactors, yes. Yeah, yeah. I think that one of the uh, possible applications concerning seeing gas fermentation is when, when you, people trying to do this in full scale, they have mm -hmm. uh, encountered several, let's see, problems with the toxicity. Uh, you have mm -hmm. cyanides, you have CO, mm -hmm. and perhaps adding use of small potentials will be enough to just avoid that toxicity problem. Uh, but I don't know, I'm not aware if somebody's just working in toxicity related to uh, adding a small potential. I in, can check uh, it for you. I I, mm. I, I don't remember it uh, by heart, but uh, I can certainly check. So you want to know uh, the impact of uh, so when you feed syngas, it's not pure syngas, but there might be some other uh, other gases compounds present in it, and they have a detrimental effect on the biocatalyst, right? Yeah, I, yeah, I use use a very general because. Uh, <coughs> Uh, I have at least not seen that there uh, is somebody in the field working on and on how this electric uh, system could solve some of the toxicity issues related to, for instance, syn gas fermentation. But is it not an option to purify the syn gas? Because I have seen some, I would not say publications, but proposals that I was evaluating passing who actually uh, have a, a pre-treatment step before they feed the syn gas to the fermenter. Yes. Uh, of course, it will add to the cost. Yes, I, I used to know about uh, some company that was wasn't able, and then they used shut down. Uh, so therefore, it, therefore, it used to raise the question: Could it be possible through, or perhaps cheaper through some electrodes? But uh, yeah, that is that is true. Mm. Okay. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Mm. Well, thank you, Carlos. It was uh, really interesting, also, seeing this fermentation. Mm -hmm. 
detrimental mm-hmm. effect on the catalyst. Yes, true. Um, any other question from 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 the audience? If not, uh, well, I just have here several. But you 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 mentioned Deepak fuel cells. Mm-hmm. Oh, you you are starting working on fuel cells at Vito. Uh, yeah. Do you think that will will there be a market for fuel cells in the short term future? Uh, instead of electric cars or, or will will there um, be no, a market uh... yeah yes i mean the, the, if you are asking the question is 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 there a future for electric uh, car that is no 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 for for electric uh, just for, now i for, i, for, I, I cells. Uh... for fuel cells i mean yeah hmm. but there will be a there will be a, a there is a, certainly but there is no competition with the uh, with the bioelectrochemical or 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 cc one well, they they have their independent markets they are not competing with the, uh, the with the same set market mm-hmm. segment even even okay because well. that is mainly for energy application here we are targeting fuels and chemical application uh-huh ah, okay well it was a misunderstanding from from my side so um well as you said also you mentioned that well we have seen that uh, there are too many applications for co2 so, uh, but what what is the how much, for instance, how much CO two is captured from from air right now, in in the technologies we are uh, in, the, in on the market now, mm-hmm. like ten percent, five percent of the CO two, the a hundred percent of the CO two. So no, no, the the uh, of course can, it, it has an impact, eh? uh, but uh, if you talk, if you talk of direct air capture. I think it's still not uh, commercially, uh, uh, economically attractive, let's say, uh, because there are companies who are doing 100, 200 euros per ton. And uh, an estimate I read, it should be less than 30 to 40, and then you have a business case. Uh, because then what you what uh, Carlos was mentioning, there are no other interfering uh, gases uh, that can hamper the, the bacteria. It's a pure CO2 scheme that you are providing, and if you couple it to a pure hydrogen scheme from another source, let's say photocatalytic, then you have a very nice uh, uh, system for the bacteria to work and and produce uh, the desired compound. Okay, so it's a question of of, of cost, not a question of yeah uh, the, the yeah yeah yeah. So the direct capture? air capture at the moment is really a question of cost. Yes, mm-hmm. I'm I'm on I'm on these technologies you have mentioned during the presentation, which which is the most promising. In your opinion, uh, in terms, of, oh yeah, in terms uh, of both, well, they also may they have been uh, compa- comparative studies. Yes, I, I understand the question, uh, but it also depends on the on the product that you are making because some of the products are very easy to make by one approach, whereas the others are easy to make by another approach. Eh? Um, also, this was also discussed yesterday about pure cultures and mixed cultures. Uh, mm-hmm. So, with the mixed cultures, it's easier to run. You don't have to worry about uh, you, you know keeping the, the uh, making it sterile and, and contamination or so, so much. Uh, that's the issue with pure cultures because then it uh, it's again adds to the cost. Whereas um, in the electrochemical one, you they are fast and you get the results uh, very quickly. Uh, the conversions are are are, are uh, uh, very rapid. But at the same time, they are also they consume much more electricity, and they are less specific. So the bioelectrochemical conversions, so to speak, are, are more specific. And if you can tune the biocatalyst by these crispr cas gene editing technology, then you actually kill all the competing pathways. And even the bacteria make three or four or five different types of products. But if you kill all those pathways and focus it only on one particular pathway, then you have a nice system at hand. Okay. Well, so it's not. Uh, I cannot say. That, yeah, uh, you, you go for this one, one no? with, with that. No, no, it depends on, on a lot of factors. But if you if you have to choose one, what 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 do you like the most? Uh, and what do you think? Is, ah, in terms of ease of working, I I, I would uh, go for electrochemical approach uh-huh. because that's easier to work with. Let's say. Okay. Well, I don't know if the people on the audience have more questions. I have here one, well, several of about this. You have already answered. Mm-hmm. I will. 
I think we can we can conclude because most of them were related with you were discussing with Carlos and well about the the, the butyric acid for for example you mentioned on the on the chat it's yeah. not a, uh, butyric acid is not a, a a good stabilizer for in the industry and and what is the application of of this uh, butyric acid in the in in the industry so you are producing this or you are uh, as a by as a sub product no it was not the main product no no, no it, it was, was it, it was, was a byproduct no? but, but we were still going for no what will be the the the, the final the mm. final application of of this butyric acid like uh, you can give i don't know an, an i don't know by heart i have to look it up i mm -hmm. Because I saw, I see that the amount of of butyric at the, at the beginning is is quite high, but then is is decreased. So uh, that's yes. good. It's, it's good to know that other uh, products are are increasing. Okay. Yeah, but you have to okay. also think, remember that it was a mixed uh, culture, eh? so mm -hmm. it was not a pure one culture like we are using in in back to view. Okay. Well. I think. Ignacio, thank you. I just yeah. want to compliment your comment, uh, your early comment about applications or where, where you can use these systems. I just want to say that in because we are mainly also biogas people working in, in Norway, and the different industries here are interested in 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 biotechnology system mainly for two reasons: because you can convert methane uh, CO2 to methane, but also a very important secondary reason, and it it is not the main target, but Biogas plants use a lot of money in treating sulfates and mm -hmm. after treating ammonium, for instance. And even if you design a system for ammonium, uh, for methane production from CO2, you can still oxidize sulfates or ammonium at the anode. So, so it's really important to know or to research a little more about the oxidation at the anode also. Uh, the impression is that uh, there's a lot of people working in methane uh, production rates. Uh, and, and perhaps secondary, very important for industry, is oxidation of sulfates and ammonium. So that is a that is a really interesting and then uh, uh, one of the areas that uh, at least I, uh, as I know, uh, many industrial partners are interested. Okay. Well, thank thank you, thank you. I appreciate your your comment. That's interesting. That uh, where the the industry are focused right now, and it's, in, it's important also to know that well they are. There are unlimited uh, possibilities, I think, to well to try to reduce emissions, to reduce CO2, and, and give another use on in bioelectrochemical systems. Okay. Yeah, and if, because you asked me, I quickly looked it up. So normally it's used. The butyric acid is used as a raw material for making esters of lower alcohols and using as a flavoring agent. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, no, yeah. it just it was just a a question because I saw the the chart and I uh, yeah yes uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Right. Interesting about it, but... Ignacio, may, may I ask something else? Yeah, 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 yeah please. Sure, Alexander. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I, I was wondering if you have, um, uh, in, this, in the context of this uh, project that you are uh, uh, developing now, um, whether you have, um, uh, a, what is the strategy behind uh, the use of hydrogen? Because as you mentioned, uh, Deepak, um, it is a... Uh, it is, uh, you, you have seen that uh, the main uh, transfer from the, the cathode to the microorganisms might be via hydrogen evolution at the cathode. So, and, and as you already know, that the, 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 the uh, hydrogen might be in the reactor uh, just for, by, for a very short fraction of time. And mm -hmm. is there any strategy in your project to, to use at a uh, high rate this uh, hydrogen for the microorganisms? Yeah. So what I can uh, say uh, is we have, so this is actually a very simple experiment. Eh? So even when you know these serum bottles uh, where you have like a very large head space, we first of all, we feed them in a definite amount of, uh, of a mixture of CO2 and hydrogen. And let's say within hours or at max one or two days, we see that the, the, it's under, under pressure. So we keep it at a little bit over pressure and after a short time, we, we measure the, the gas composition again, and we see there is almost, almost no, the hydrogen is completely gone. At the same time, the, the product is formed in the, in the electrolyte where the bacteria is growing. So that is already the first indication that hydrogen is, is quite limiting. 
in back to few the idea is to have two approaches to not make it uh, the case one is to because we will supply few to external and we will also have a photo catalytic reactor that will be using uh, the atomic quantum clusters and using direct sunlight yeah, to split uh, water into into hydrogen and that hydrogen will be but because that photo system is indeed uh, limited on on uh, availability of sun let's say that's why we make this second option of uh, in situ hydrogen production at a high rate by 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 making those capillary electrodes that i showed um, earlier in the presentation so in any condition we will make sure that there is always enough hydrogen present in the system and uh, the biocatalyst is not limited by that that's the strategy we are going to use yeah um, uh, what i meant yeah I I understand now that uh, there there won't be any uh, limitation by the hydrogen in, mm -hmm. in your um, in your project, but mm -hmm. uh, the solubility of hydrogen is. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, yeah. Sorry, I forgot to mention the the reactor yeah, I mean that, is pressurized. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that okay. also improves. Eh? That's why. Sorry, sorry, I forgot to mention this. The the reactor which was under construction that you uh, that I showed earlier can go up to ten bars. So that is the main strategy. That is the main for strategy you to, to, to solubilize the, hydrogen. Yeah, right. Um, okay. Thank you. Correct. 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 Yes. Well, we can uh, we can uh, Alessandro, if you want, we can arrange a, another meeting, another conversation, also with uh, the consortium of Actufuel, if you are interested in knowing more about. Uh, in detail about this this uh, concrete part okay so i don't know you can you can send me an email or deepak you can arrange a conversation we can oh yeah yeah absolutely can, feel free to write to me yeah. anytime thank you thank you guys okay. well thank you all for for uh, for for today's webinar i think it was uh, quite interesting i think that most of the questions were were really really nice and thank you Deepak for for the presentation thank you all for for gathering today and just a kind reminder for for tomorrow tomorrow we will finish this series of webinars when where we are going to talk about more economy and uh, a parallel project that is uh, aligned with uh, back to fuel that is called my dice where we are going to explain the tools we are using in order to boost the commercial part okay so thank you again, and I hope to see you tomorrow at 11.30, okay, uh, through, via, through Zoom, okay, the same application as, as this one. Thank you so much. I appreciate your time. And, thank and, you, Ignacio. Thanks have for a, organizing, and thanks everyone for thanks attending. Have, have a nice day. Yeah, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.